Okay, so we're live there now. So, Jigui uh, Palera Korja, August Falcherothka, 100 Years of Irish Film. I'm delighted to host uh, this special event tonight with Patrick Murray, who's the executive director and co founder of the Irish Film Festival right here in Ottawa. Um, if you haven't had the pleasure yet, the film festival is absolutely brilliant. Um, it was online this year, but it's one of the definitely the high points, I think, of the Auto Irish community when it's in person every year here as well. So hopefully we'll be back to in person next year, Patrick, or even a hybrid and uh, people can head along to that then. Uh, before we go any further, I would just like to acknowledge the Algonquin Nation, whose traditional and unceded territory we are gathered upon tonight. I know that our viewers are tuning in from all across Canada, and so I'd also like to acknowledge your traditional um, caretakers and owners of those lands too. Um, so without any further ado, uh, Patrick, let's get right into it. So uh, what can you tell us about the significance of Liam O'Leary in Irish film history? Laura, yes, uh, Liam O'Leary, um, when it comes to um, often um, um, celebrating uh, film history and capturing it, often it's especially when it comes to film, it seems it usually comes down to sometimes the most uh, inauspicious characters. Like in this case, Liam Leary was born in 1910, passed away in 1992. And he was a, a, a co-founder of the Irish Film Society. He was also an actor, a writer, film researcher, historian, and archivist. And actually until 1986, he basically had this massive archive of films and uh, publications and letters and, um, in his apartment in Dublin, uh, which he gave up to the National Library in Ireland. And then eventually he laid the cornerstone for the uh, Irish Film Archive, which is now run by the Irish Film Institute. And, uh, and they took on all his papers and all his, his works and stuff. Uh, the Irish, um, his major contribution is the Irish Film Society, as, uh, as well as uh, being the holder of uh, uh, Ireland's history, film history. Um, and that film site was established in 1936. So he was holding on to that 50 years and collecting on it and writing on it. Um, he was also interested in international films as well. Um, and some of the stuff he would care, he would pick up too is like the smallest of things like, like he, for a theater in, in Cork in the, the 19, 19 teens, like 1916, he would have like the engagement book and it would have notes like the... Uh, Often back then theaters, uh, they didn't just show films, they also had vaudevillian type performances. And the, this book would show 1916, uh, performers did not show up due to uh, Sinn Féin activity in Dublin. <laughs> so I guess they couldn't get out of the city. Um, so you'd find this, So it's also a great uh, reservoir of um, social history, uh, which of course film uh, and any art is, is uh, connected with. Um, so the, the uh, Film Society was established in 1936. And, uh, and one of the things about it uh, this, that was unique about it was that it was not uh, subject to the censors okay. uh, because it was like a film club. So it would play out of like a, a private uh, location and they would show films, both uh, Irish films, but also they would bring in international films. And they... Um, and the Irish film censors, unfortunately, were notorious for if they didn't ban the film outright, they butchered them. And sometimes for the uh, smallest of reasons, mm -hmm. um, like, for example, any kind of uh, dialogue that involved infidelity, for example, that would have to be cut out. So um, they were able to show them without without any worries about uh, the censors, which made them unique. And initially they had a Dublin chapter with about 80 people and it grew across the country to about 3000 people. Um, they would, they would, besides uh, showing alternative films, they also did uh, film discussions, they did lectures, even film schools before there was anything like that. And, if, and even a junior film society. Um, as an amateur group, the Irish Society was exempt from seeking approval from the state censors, but uh, they weren't immune to political events. Uh, during World War II, uh, uh, Eamon de Valera, uh, he was uh, very hard and fast about maintaining that neutrality. So even clubs, uh, was not allowed to show any kind of films that would indicate that there's a conflict going on outside of Ireland. So things like Casablanca, you know, would be held off, you know. Um, so that, so he did have uh, films that were reduced. However, also he was, um, Liam Malier himself, because he was a filmmaker, he made a film called Our Country, which was a party political film for, part of my terrible Gaelic uh, clan, uh, Publacta, uh, P-O-B-L-A-C-H-T-A. Yeah, on the yeah. public, I think. Close enough. 
Yeah. So the Finnafail government wasn't pleased with it, and TD Shaw McEntee in particular, and there was uh, much uh, toing and froing in the in the press about it, including him uh, attacking him as a director of the of the society, which he wasn't at the time, and as well uh, going after him for communist propaganda films. Okay. And um, if you go to the IFI, even on their online, you could see there's examples of like uh, written documentation with the society clarifying things that, mm -hmm. and him admitting the TD, that is, that uh, looking closer at the program, he realized it was much more balanced. It wasn't all Russian films. And he realized now that Liam O'Leary is now uh, like an honorary member, mm -hmm. not a director. But yeah, so they still wound up getting into some uh, public uh, fights with the government. Uh, over the films and and the films that they and the uh, as well as the, the films made by people involved with the uh, society, um, so the, especially uh, the Battleship Potemkin caused a lot of controversy, and uh, the uh, uh, the Weekly Newspaper of the Irish Catholic uh, was was uh, fervently against it, even though it was a private screening. So they weren't completely uh, uh, immune. Um, yeah, I think that was kind of common back then as well. Just, you know, I, I remember uh, one thing I talk about in kind of my lectures on queer history for Ireland as well is that, you know, when RTE was invented, a uh, uh, TD stood up in the doll and said that RTE was responsible for opening the floodgates to lust because of the Late Late Show. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I think we've we've come a long way, hopefully. I should have said, by the way, Patrick, before I asked you that first question, I should have said to anyone that's watching right now that would like to ask us questions at the end, if you're watching on YouTube there to the right of the screen, if you're on a computer, you'll see a chat box where feel free to ask your questions or comments or even just say hello. If you're watching on a mobile device, the chat box is just underneath the video. So don't be shy, as they say. Um, so yeah, I suppose following on from um, what you were just saying there, uh, Patrick, can you tell us a bit more about native Irish film production in the first half of the 20th century? Yes. Uh, so Ireland didn't have any kind of a national, like people think of uh, what is now Screen Ireland and previously that Irish Film Board, which is actually fairly recent. And, uh, but back then they didn't have anything like that. And um, while Ireland itself created, uh, had a great deal of interest from British and American productions as, uh, but the, they didn't have a lot of support for uh, homegrown uh, filmmakers. A lot of them actually were uh, people who had, who had the money, like business people who were interested in photography, who could buy the, uh, the equipment and make the films themselves. And then they would get distribution in, uh, say, New York or places like that. And often the 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 the, uh, the reviews would be uh, pretty unkind. They would say that the scenery was amazing, but the uh, the acting and the production values were pretty poor. Um, the American and the British productions were slightly better, but they tended to upset the locals, uh, the native Irish, for their depictions of Irish people. Um, they were, a lot of them were newsreels and travel logs. So the travel logs were okay so for most part. Uh, and they were designed, they were very popular in the 1910s and the 1900s as it was a way for the diaspora and far places in America, Australia, Canada to see back home, you know, especially when they started doing color tinting and the like. But the stories were often, uh, uh, you know, uh, stage Irish or professional Irish kind of thing like, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the bumbling uh, tough guy or, um, you know, uh, the, 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 um, just all the, the stereotypes you can think of. <laughs> I tend not to watch these films, so I can't <laughs> be in my head, but uh, just the kind of the stage Irish stereotypes that a lot of uh, native Irish people even today find quite offensive that the kind of stuff that caused some controversy with the recent film Wild uh, Mountain Time, uh, which is interesting 120 years later. And you still see foreign productions who create tourism for Ireland, but the stories and they mix it up with uh, uh, British and uh, American actors with storylines like, uh, you know, the father that owns the farm and, and the daughter who wants to take it over. But, he, but, you know, we can't have a female doing that. And then the guy who wants to be with her and the one she really loves and just people get tired of it uh, and they don't. And the, but even 120 years ago, pre, uh, priests, but even just uh, regular Irish people were, were like enraging and even the newspapers about how they were being depicted in these, these productions. Um, now, the, the native Irish producers, the ones that were making films often, then they were making films that were uh, 
not surprisingly, about uh, the conflicts that were going on at the time, like the War of Independence. Uh, there are a lot of actually, particularly in the first 20 to 30 years of film productions here leading up to the 1916 um, rebellion, um, the Easter Rebellion. You're making a lot of films about stuff that happened in the 1700s and the 1800s and uh, uh, Irish versus British. And for most part, actually, the British authorities were OK with them, probably because their values were the production values weren't that great. Um, also, they were probably just trying to keep a lid on that powder cake. So there was only so much they could do. Um, but that said, there was still uh, politics still definitely got into it. For example, uh, there was a Republican loan film made. Um, in 1918, I think it was, or 1916, and uh, made on the, and no cinema would show it in Dublin for fear, I think, of the Black and Tans reprisals. So volunteers would show up with uh, fast cars and uh, go into the projection booth with guns and make them show the Republican loan uh, PSA. And then they would grab the film and they'd run off and go on to the next one. Um, but that said, films that were shown that were pro-British, sometimes the theaters got burned to the ground. So <laughs> it kind of went both ways. Um, but it started off in around the same time as Lumiere's around 1890 and those uh, films often were road showed and they were uh, taken around the country and shown like in halls and people's even people's houses. Um, and they were usually like almost like a variety act as well like uh, the, one of them had like a female impersonator as part of the show. They'd have acrobats sometimes. So, uh, because a lot of times these were just newsreels or just uh, firemen going to a fire or something like that. So they had to add more to it to be more interesting to them. Um, the other issue was that fi uh, film everywhere actually was not very popular with stage actors, who, which were the best actors at the time at the turn of the century. Um, and in particular in Ireland, the best actors were typically the Abbey Theatre and a few other societies and they and it was considered slumming so um to get native uh, actors of quality was almost impossible and when they did uh sometimes what would happen is the abbey theater would would not allow them to advertise that they're abbey theater actors which would help with the which would hurt their sales uh, over in the states um so but with the conflict of uh of the Irish War of Independence and then the Civil War and then a, a country reborn, as, as as you know, I'm speaking to the Irish Embassy early to tell you, like they didn't have a lot of money for investing in an Irish film industry. So up until the 1950s, I mean, a lot of the native Irish stuff was foreigners coming in and making their version of Ireland. And often that was to please Irish diaspora, often second or third generation Irish. And their views of Ireland was much more fanciful, much more of the fairy tale and leprechaun version. And that's what sold, so that's what got made. But interestingly enough, there was a period too of uh, that's little known late 20s and early 30s um, where Irish Jewish romances became popular like Abby's Irish Rose, um, kind of Romeo and Juliet situations, but they were very popular with Irish and Jewish audiences, which were large uh, film goers in the 20s and 30s. Now, when it came to the uh, the actors, of course, now we know like Barry Fitzgerald and Maureen, uh, Maureen O'Hara, uh, Sarah Allgood, uh, these, these, and of course, later on, Gabriel Byrne and Liam Neeson all went through Abbey Theatre, but that was in the 30s, and a lot of times they just went to Hollywood, which was another issue for Abbey Theatre that would upset them too, was a problem. So... So would you say that like that was the main challenges was funding the Abbey like theaters groups not wanting their actors to slum it in films or was there exactly. other things at play? Well, um, as you know, like uh, um, sorry, it's stinking hot here. <laughs> um, but uh, um, as as you probably aware that acting for film is very different from acting for stage, and the thing is is you're right, funding was the big thing. Um, it wasn't given the funding it needed or the support it required to develop uh, talented directors, uh, film technicians and actors uh, who were particular to that. Like in the States, even though there was uh, actors would, would hide their names or pretend that they weren't working for Biograph or Vitograph or things like that. There was the kind of money in America where they, these studios could set up and they could turn out these films until it became more acceptable. And they could also pay the actors better to eventually they didn't care anymore. Um, but in Ireland, they held stronger to a more of a purity to their acting as far as stage is preferred. Um, I think the other thing that, that worked against too is that the stage Irish or the uh, uh, professional Irish went away 
at the turn of the century. Um, stage, the actual stage theater productions in the 19th century, particularly in America, uh, grew up and became more highbrow. And the kind of Irish films you see today, which are more introspective and more diverse, um, you were seeing that in stage uh, plays 100 years ago, you know, and they were moving away from that. But the theater picked up that, uh, the, sorry, the film picked that up and ran with it. And uh, because, and then film became the, the, the theater for the masses and that, that continued on. Uh, but the thing is, is without funding and without a concerted effort by the government to try and develop, to help a small country like that develop their film program, uh, it was hard. So they were constantly being sandwiched. Ireland was constantly being sandwiched between these two major markets, England and, uh, and or Britain and, uh, and America. So would it be fair to say then that where kind of Irish film was lacking in maybe its technical or its artistic talent, they were making it up with the literary side of things, like the storylines and everything else in film? Yes, exactly. Like these uh, British and American production uh, companies um, were feasting on Irish literary giants. That is that is uh, that is no question. That, that's where Ireland was well represented. Unfortunately, the film industry wasn't getting anything out of it. Um, but uh, for sure, uh, the uh, uh, the literary aspect, though, was was exploding. I mean, uh, as as you know, Ireland is a uh, rich, um, a fertile soil for um, uh, for literary uh, for storytelling, and uh, and with that in mind, um, the likes of um, uh, Jonathan Swift, Gulliver's Travels has been done so many times, um, dozens. Uh, George Bernard Shaw not only did, has so many of his films, uh, his plays been made in, in short and stories been made into films. He actually wrote the screenplays for many of them. And, uh, and not only that, some a couple of, uh, uh, after he dies, a couple of classic films, um, My Fair Lady, of course, is based on Pygmalion and later um, Pretty Woman, which launched Julia Roberts, which is also based on Pygmalion. And though some may think that he might have been offended and rolling in his grave, uh, that's not the case at all. He apparently reportedly said to Samuel Goldwyn of MGM that his problem was he was into making art and he was into making money. So he was he would have been well fine with uh, My Fair Lady. And not only that, actually, the royalties apparently um, are used as per his will to fund the National Gallery so of Ireland, um, goes towards them. So the moving pictures uh, funds the... Uh, still pictures um but also of course uh, probably one of the most famous that the uh, the our listeners would know or our audience would know about is of course bram stoker and dracula and uh it, you can't even begin to count how many films have been based on that legend um and that story and then um and then of course we have um, james joyce even uh, although been mixed results as far as making his uh his stories in the movies, but he also actually he owned a theater. He started the Volta in 1909, and because he was a big believer in film, and it lasted. He, his involvement lasted about a year or two, but he actually was like a you could think of it as an art house cinema. It was brought in all kinds of films from the continent, from France and Germany. Uh, but he was not much of a an owner for film uh, for the uh, for owning a theater, and I got out of it after a couple of years. Liam O'Leary, as it happens, actually as part of his archives of the IFI did many interviews with the projectionist that was involved with that the theater and he had much to say about James Joyce. So something worth looking into. Um, of course, uh, then if, uh, there's Sean O'Casey with uh, Juno and the Paycock, which was actually adopted by Hitchcock. It's a little, not as well known from 1930, uh, probably partly because Sean O'Casey was so disappointed with the film, he wouldn't let it be screened during his lifetime. It was a little too cinematic for his liking, including soliloquies being ruined by, well, he would view as ruined by cutaways. And Hitchcock used a lot of sickly sweet music, like Irish, what we would consider uh, like American Irish type music. And uh, even though apparently Hitchcock was driven around Dublin to show the inspiration for that play, uh, he kind of put that aside and, and made a kind of film that uh, Sean O'Casey wasn't pleased with. Um, and, uh, and then so on from there. So yes, yeah, so so what happened? So a lot of films were made based on Irish plays and and movies, but nobody was tapping into uh, Irish ta uh, film talent. So, and that continues to this day, of course. 
yeah because yeah. even just to go back to wild mountain time that you mentioned there the, a lot of american films set in ireland they very rarely use irish actors and that's why the accents are so jarring i think and that immediately takes you out of this is a movie in ireland because the actor i just personally anyway it takes me immediately out of being immersed in the film but uh, we can we can come back to that <laughs> come back to that later i know we're gonna have a chat about that later um I, I, sorry i'll just add one other thing to that uh, oscar wilde's had many of his plays and stories and and it's been noted that some of them some of them, even though they're considered classic films oscar wilde himself probably wouldn't recognize okay yeah because just true. the way they changed them around and the mm -hmm. type of actors he used yeah Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just going to ask you, because um, I was having a look at a few things before this, what could you tell us all about uh, Major General Emmett Dalton and his role as a film pioneer in Ireland? Oh, yes, Major Emmett Dalton. So he is actually, uh, like De Valera, he's actually born in America, but uh, he was, but he came to Ireland when he was two years old. So he was born in 1898 and passed away in 1978 in Dublin. Uh, his dad was... His parents were Irish Americans, um, not from Ireland, but the, his dad was very much, um, you might say that very much uh, plastic patty, I guess somebody might be an unkind. He, he was very much a nationalist as an American and he actually decided to put his money where his mouth is and he moved to Ireland in, in 1900 and was very much involved in nationalist activities. So, um, and he took that on and Emmett followed in his footsteps, Emmett being named after Robert Emmett as well, just to show his, his dedication to nationalist causes. And, uh, and actually by the time uh, Major General uh, uh, Dalton was uh, 15, he was already involved with the Irish volunteers before World War I uh, smuggling guns uh, for the home rulers. And then uh, because the home rulers were okay, were pro World War I and with the idea that if we fight for England, we'll get home rule out of this, uh, Dalton signed up and was an officer in, for the British Army and fought in the Somme, and Somme, excuse me, as well as in Palestine, received a military cross. And, uh, but uh, as you probably know, eventually the Home Rulers became disillusioned with World War I. And uh, when he came back, he switched over to the Republican side and he became a close friend of Michael Collins and part of the uh, squad. His younger brother was one of the squad members as well. And uh, actually was uh, there when Michael Collins was assassinated and died in his arms. Later on, he was uh, slandered with people suggesting that he was the one that might have killed him. But that's uh, not even, from what I've read, that couldn't even be possible. It's just not in his character. Um, so with the passing of Michael Collins, uh, he became disillusioned with the politics and he got out of it um, and got involved in the golfer, as well as he was big into the horses and he was good at it, more or less. And uh, and he had a whiskey business. And then 1939, that started to go south with World War II. So he, through his golfing, he got connected with people from Paramount. And he became a UK distributor for Paramount. And actually, World War II found himself in London uh, in the middle of another conflict. This guy uh, was very lucky. <laughs> he keeps surviving these conflicts. And uh, despite the, the the London bombings, the, uh, the he was he was actually an air raid warden. And it was possible that he was even offered an opportunity to be part of Lord Mountbatten's uh, a special espionage behind the lines kind of uh, commando team, which he turned down apparently um, because of the way he was uh, and his experience, but he wasn't interested in that. Um, and then eventually he got, he left that and he went into Samuel Golden Mayor uh, representing MGM in the, uh, in the late forties, early fifties. And then, after an experience over helping produce television for uh, in England for America, The Adventures of Robin Hood, which is very popular, and uh, and a Scotland Yard series that starred Boris Karloff, he wanted to do the same for Ireland in the 50s. Um, so this is where he gets into film and he sets up a production company and he starts working, actually realizing that the, the problem with actors, uh, as for first of all, having good actors, but he also wanted to produce uh, he wanted to build a studio that would also develop Irish talent. 
that that wound up being the Ardmore Studios. But the first thing he did is he got in an agreement with the Abbey Theatre, which was at first was tough to do because they were reluctant. They were already uh, in the 50s annoyed with constantly losing actors to Hollywood. So I think he sold them on the idea that they could stay, they could do both stage and screen if they can land in Ireland. And then on top of that, he made a deal with RKO Pictures to develop these television movies based on Abbey Road, uh, Abbey, excuse me, Abbey Theatre, uh, Abbey Theatre Place. Um, which eventually, which he wound up happening. He made about 13 of them. The, the, uh, and then the, through this, uh, he made the studios so that the players wouldn't have to go to England for interiors as well. And uh, once the studio was made, um, things started to fall apart with Abbey Theatre because RKO wanted more broader films um, and more, more t different material. Also, the other issue was that it wasn't paying the bills. It was Ardmore Studios. It's massive. It's got four uh, sound stages plus a mansion, huge property. And um, he was actually relying on financing from an Irish film credit program, but also from a British uh, film uh, subsidy system, too. And that was creating problems because <laughs> he... Um, in order to avail that, they had to be a British studio, but they were in Ireland in the late 50s and early 60s. So that meant he had to use British technicians. So it was causing him problems with actually developing Irish talent. And uh, so eventually with all those political, and then also there was, he was having trouble with distribution. So he's producing these films out of Ireland, but nobody was, they weren't made by major studios. So nobody was really interested in, in distributing them. And there were some great films that were made, unfortunately, that didn't get seen enough. Um, and he wasn't bringing in enough people, enough people, uh, like say Hollywood films to justify it. So, and then he was getting pressures because uh, UK distributors wouldn't show the films because they were from Ireland. And then, uh, and then of course, questions over him accessing this fund, this British fund. So, so he got it going in 58 and by 63 he was out of it and pretty much retired. But he got the ball rolling. The Ardmore Studios is still there today. Um, it went through many different changes, including, as it happens, uh, an English director, John Borman, who took it over in the 70s as kind of the creative director. I guess kind of like Jack Charlton taking over the soccer team in the in the early 90s. Um, and he made like Excalibur. And uh, and then there was other films made there, like The Spy Came In From The Cold, The Taylor of Panama in 2001, Angela's Ashes, Braveheart. The Tudors were filmed there. And it's still being uh, used today. So it's since it's gone through many iterations, but now it's a successful studio. And also there's the Ashford and it's in Wick, Wicklow. And it also has as uh, in Wicklow, of course, the Ashford studios, which Vikings was made in. Um, so from that little idea that kind of lasted about four or five years and fell on its face came this uh, actually a little seed grew to this massive uh, uh, industry in Ireland for a small country like Ireland now that produces all these great films plus does co-productions cool thanks to these studios that are there and that was all started by this uh, uh, American basically raised in I Irish raised in Ireland uh, uh, from the um, from the uh, 100 years ago. Great well it sounds like he made a serious contribution to the landscape of it. And um, I think those kind of contributions lead me nicely into my next question, which I think a lot of our viewers are going to be very interested in, is the evolution of censorship in Irish society and particularly in the sort of film and even television industry. I know you're just going to speak to film, but like, yeah, it was, a, uh, you know, the censors, uh, you know, I think a lot of people will be interested in that. So just tell us everything you know. Yes. Uh, yeah. Censorship can often lead to hilarious results. I mean, it really... It, it really is, it's kind of like trying to like, uh, you know, hold molasses in your hands, the tighter you squeeze, the more it just comes out, right? And it really is about control. I don't wanna, and um, and often it just backfires. I mean, an example would be uh, Neptune's Daughter, which was be screened in 1915. It was actually by a guy who was born in Ireland. I should have mentioned earlier, there's some very successful Irish directors but they left Ireland, unfortunately, this is an old story, but they left Ireland when they were teenagers and went to the States and developed their talents there. Um, but this one was by an Irish, uh, American film by an Irish born Herbert Brennan called Neptune's Daughter. Uh, the lead was actually a little more scantily clad than you would be surprised how scantily clad apparently she was. And a local priest denounced that film publicly. And the result was that uh, 
a run on the tickets and a lot of people were turned away and disappointed. It was a bit like uh, the Father Ted episode where uh, they're protesting outside the theater and I, I just encouraged Down with this sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, down with this sort of thing. <laughs> Uh, but there was also just silliness like uh, the Garden of Isla, which is by uh, American director Rex Ingram, actually Irish born. He was born in, uh, in uh, Dublin and he was actually, uh, Liam O'Leary wrote a book on him about the master of silent cinema. He, he, uh, he's most famous for being associated with uh, Valentino for the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse and uh, I think the Conquer. And um, so he made the Garden of Isla and that had to be screened before the canon uh, O'Connell who represented the Archbishop of Dublin. And their issue was, was it was the lead was called Father Antoine. And they thought that implied he was an ordained priest. And the title cards of the sign had to be changed to Brother Antoine because a renegade monk was okay, but not to be a priest, not all right. So eventually it was formalized in 1923 with the Censorship Films Act. And it was advocated by such, um, uh, uh, liberal groups as, and that's sarcasm, as the Irish Vigilance Association, the Priest Social Guild, that must have been an interesting night of cards, uh, the Social Reform Committee, and various church groups, um, no less than W.B. Yeats objected to this, uh, saying he wished to leave the arts superior or inferior to the general conscience of mankind. Um, I can't agree with him more on that. Um, but films that were indecent, blasphemous, or obscene could be banned or cut to pieces. In the first year of operation, 104 films were banned and a further 166 were cut. Uh, but there was some issues like uh, for funding. Uh, when talkies first came in, the censor didn't have the funding to have a, uh, the ability to play the soundtrack. So he was just watching these films silent. So they would put these certificates saying that the plot and centered, uh, the plot and sound not censored. I guess it would be a notice on the film. It was almost like saying lifeguard not on duty. So you're being warned that we don't know what's actually being said here. Um, but films of homosexual overtones, uh, as late as 1962, like Roman Polanski's uh, Knife in the Water, were passed because it was argued the average Irishman had no knowledge of homosexuality and therefore no harm to be done. So, <laughs> but then you have other things like the Marx Brothers monkey business was banned outright because it, they were afraid it would incite anarchy. Uh, the Great Dictator was banned, but that's understandable. 1940, I think they probably looked at that as being a, a danger to their neutrality, um, Irish neutrality. Title changes were often made. That was kind of funny, like uh, for religious beliefs. Um, the film I Want a Divorce in 1940 was changed to The Tragedy of Divorce. Um, <laughs> and then even just little lines, like in Casablanca, which was finally shown after World War II, because it was important that nobody knew that there was something going on outside of Ireland because of neutrality. Uh, the line, if that plane leaves the ground and you're not with him, you'll regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but sooner for the rest of your life. Uh, that was cut out uh, because uh, there was uh, this and any other suggestion that the hero and married heroine had actually fallen in love. So infidelity, right? So that line was left out. Um, Gone with the Wind was was uh, butchered up. Uh, Rear Window, Rashomon, Doctor Strangelove. These are just some of the films that were that that were cut to pieces. And really, this was the case in Ireland right until the eighties. Uh, these films, if you had seen them in Ireland, if they were shown legally, they would have been uh, cut to pieces. Um, the other issue was secrecy. Up until the mid '80s, you couldn't even see what their decisions were about, uh, and they claimed uh, the uh, esteemed uh, Irish film scholar Kevin Rocket made a wrote a book on this in 2004, and he had tr struggles for the longest time getting access to the their their paperwork and the access to information. Um, they were claiming uh, that it was because of. Uh, uh, confidential commercial contracts with the film distributors, but some of these were going back to the 20s and 30s. They just, and he thinks that part of it was they were afraid of being ridiculed, you know, like the like the decisions on the homosexuality, like uh, you know, the title changes and things like that. Um, it wasn't until uh, Seamus Smith uh, took over, I think it was 1998, that he released all the records and then some. And then ever since then, it's been a it's been an open book. Um, the other thing is, is, so it continued on and, um, until actually really the mid eighties, and then it started to change 
and it was really but not in but even then it was it was really the 90s that they started to do it more as an age classification but until then especially the catholic church had a strong hold on it so anything that was considered anti-religious um what was uh, was cut out um anything that would would mess with the morals um so it's it's only in the last 20 to 25 years that classifications have changed they're no longer interested in uh cutting apart the work of the of the, the filmmaker and just basically informing the public as far as um is this appropriate for children or is this appropriate for teenagers or adults as, as it should be really and then leave it to people to decide what they want to watch and not want to watch um but and it would it would also uh censorship i would find in more passive ways like for example um the in, in anticipation of uh the inauguration of broadcasting in Ireland with the foundation of RTE in 1961, a group of uh, Dublin priests put together uh, a documentary program called uh, Rorick, I believe it's called, Irish for Vision. Um, and actually it was pretty award-winning, <laughs> to be honest. It was, it did really well with them. It was kind of like an Irish 60 minutes and uh, current affairs. And, um, and they did a domestic international, uh, they did take on controversial subjects sometimes, but the principle behind it was that, again, this kind of patronizing uh, of, uh, of the Irish people and the idea that, oh, this, this scary thing that is cinema must be controlled because it, the masses can't control themselves. I think the idea of the theater scared people too. Uh, the idea that this place that had, uh, as actually one literature wrote, I guess at one time, central heating would matter a lot in Ireland, and it was a cheap place where you could spend the day which was warm, but it was also dark. And you didn't, couldn't, there wasn't control of what was on the screen or they wanted to control what was on the screen. And of course, not only was it dark, and they also allowed teenagers and adults to get into shenanigans amongst themselves as well, and, which scared them. So it was like you're out of the public eye and not being watched, um, which drove a lot of censorship. But the main thing is they were afraid of how, uh, uh, that it would have this hypnotic influence on people, which I think that's always kind of been the way with art before it was opera, stage plays being controlled because they were afraid that it would incite the masses. So, but yeah, and, uh, but some of the, well, with Warwick, um, they did take on some interesting stuff. Like they did a four part series on the Irish famine. Um, they took on, uh, and internationally, they, they looked at uh, travelers in, in the US, uh, the Irish in the making of Canada, they did that in 1993, French Connection, they did uh, shows on the Irish in Montserrat, as well as Argentina. Um, an interesting one I think I'd like to see called Guatemala, where the Pope is a communist. Um, and incidentally, these are actually all available um, at the, on the IFI player, uh, Irish Film Institute. If you just, even if you just Google uh, R-A-D-H-A-R-C, for those that don't know how to uh, spell it, uh, Rorick, R-A-D-H-A-R-C, I-F-I, they will come up and there's plenty of, uh, of those. And then you can see the interesting case of uh, these 60 minutes type documentaries, but the guys in a police, uh, uh, a priest uniform. <laughs> well, that was brilliant, definitely. I'll check that out later. Thank you for the recommendation. Um, yeah, I suppose to go back to um, just talking about the sort of um, wild mountain time and the sort of faux idea, oh, well, not faux idea, because again, like it is people's experience of Irishness that maybe have not grown up in Ireland. And obviously you have to kind of respect that as well, because that's, of course, the audience that these studios are trying to reach out to. But I was fascinated after the trailer for Wild Men's and Time came out, just like the immediate backlash on Twitter, where firstly, people were like, when is this set? Because it looks like it's a modern Manhattan in one scene. And then it looks like Emily Blunt doesn't own a bar of soap because she's in Ireland in another scene. She's got the dirty face and I've just come in from the farm and I'm standing here in my tweed and Wellington boots. But, you know, and it's about the father's farm or whatever. And then an Irish uh, comedy group immediately made like a parody of every Irish film ever. That's just like people, you know, keening in the corner with sadness about the land and all this kind of stuff. And even if you look at like, you know, your Hollywood productions like P.S. I Love You, uh, Leap Year, all of that. And it's, you know, accents that are so not 
Irish, but they don't ever seem to hire Irish actors for some reason. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, can you tell us a little bit about Irish images on screen? Because I feel like they haven't changed in the last 100 years, and particularly how people are, are depicted. So if you could talk to us a bit about that. Um, you're right. It hasn't changed over the last 100 years or even 120 years. Um, unfortunately to some degree. I mean, I enjoy a good laugh as much as anybody, like for example, The Waking Dead Divine. And actually with the Irish Film Festival, it is common criticism. We, we, not, we don't get a lot, but if we do get a criticism, it's usually somebody saying that they were hoping for more like The Wild Mountain Time or more like um, The uh, Waking Dead Divine. Um, as much as like a good laugh, and I do try to have, we like to have lighter films in there as well, but I think we have to remember that I mean, the Irish is not a nation of court gestures and dancing monkeys here. And um, there's a lot more to that country, of course, and to that nation. And, and there are diverse people with uh, needs, wants, and uh, politics. I mean, I just dabble a little bit in adult in, and even there, you, you can see the very entangled web of Irish politics of him going from home ruler to fighting for the British, to fighting for the Irish, to being on the pro treaty side. And I didn't even get into, of course, the issues that he had later in life because of that, right? So um, uh, with politics and stuff. Um, but people don't want, what, what's happened instead is you get this very kind of distilled version uh, uh, of this kind of uh, fanciful idea of this, like the quiet man embodies that. An enjoyable film, but it also has a lot of regrettable stereotypes in it that was perpetuated before and afterwards. And the director, John Ford, uh, was born to Irish parents, um, loved Ireland, and he was very much uh, uh, had an affinity for Ireland. But as, as one person said, he viewed Ireland through the, uh, the lens of an, a leprechaun. You know, he was all about castles and, and uh, that kind of fanciful, you know, Bray Barry Fitzgerald as the kind of drinking, uh, you know, matchmaker, goofy kind of clown. And then you also have the stereotype of the big kind of boorish uh, 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 kind of a mule of a man, but not too smart, uh, like Victor McLaughlin, you know, in The Informer. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, Barry Fitzgerald and Victor McLaughlin both won Oscars for playing like priests and these boorish kind of mules. And the, the, where it comes from is the stage Irish or professional Irish of the 19th century, in, in, especially in, in America, where second or third generation diaspora kind of look back on Ireland with more of a kind of unrealistic uh, rose colored lens, uh, like a leprechaun lepre lepre lens really, to be honest. And, uh, but as, sta as stage became more highbrow, film came in and, and picked that up and continued with the lowbrow. And mm -hmm. Barry Fitzgerald, for example, made a very good career. And as somebody commented, they're not even sure if he was a good actor or if he was just good at playing those type of, of stereotypes. Yeah. Um, and what's amazing is that despite the fact that Ireland uh, very much uh, spends a lot of money and a lot of effort on uh, supporting uh, and developing a, uh, an Irish film uh, culture, I mean, you have, your Irish, you have the National Film uh, Institute now or the School of Film, you have um, Screen Ireland, which actively supports uh, the funding and development of films and filmmakers. Uh, you have the studios. And as those who, who, who attend our, our film festivals, as well as Irish film festivals, and even TIFF that usually gets four or five films, you know that it's more than The Quiet Man, a lot more than that, a lot more than you can sit the person in the corner or uh, people mucking around in, in Wellingtons and uh, poor and, and, and really kind of like uh, humorously stupid, you know, which is really offensive to a lot of people. And it was, as I think I mentioned earlier, it was offensive even back then. People were writing letters to the editor in 1915 or 20, just raging, just raging about how they were being de depicted as basically uh, farm animals, like idiots. Yeah. Um, even though they, uh, and of course, because they lived there, they didn't have any appreciation for all the scenery that was being uh, exported elsewhere, which is, I think, what really people like. I saw an ad that uh, Wild Mountain Time has driven up uh, the uh, uh, Irish, or an interest in Irish tourism, which is, I guess, is great. Um, but people should know when you go to Ireland that it's just like Canada or States or anywhere else. It's a, it's a mix and it's diverse people with, uh, and they're more than just uh, leprechauns and uh, priests and uh, um, goofy uh, dr drinking uh, Barry Fitzgeralds and, 
some guys you can hear now and everything yeah <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Um, but like I find it interesting as well that in some movies not even ones that are set in Ireland but just movies that have that sort of character of just an Irish person in the background just like a minor character like even I'm trying to think there was some some movie I watched when I was a teenager I think it was is it Angels and Demons that one with like Tom Hanks based on that like silly Dan Brown book or whatever but in the book the priest the, his whole storyline is that he's Italian but they've changed it to he's Irish in the movie because only Irish people can be priests. And that's like a trope that comes up a lot, I think. Just like your your Irish priest, no matter what the film is, the priest is Irish. And um, so I think that's that's very interesting as well. It's true. And then even in Braveheart, which is filmed in Ireland for most part, mm -hmm. you have the uh, the uh, Irish character in that one who plays the the, uh, the comic relief. Yeah. He's kind of like crazy psycho guy, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's like, it's funny because there's such a breadth of like indigenous Irish cinema now. Like, because I've gone to TIFF for the last few years and kind of seen what's coming out of Ireland at the minute. And, you know, even like you've shown them yourselves at the film fest with like horror movies and stuff. You don't think horror movies when you think Ireland, but there's some great stuff coming out. And um, I saw, I don't know, have you seen Sea Fever? Um, just played on every fear I have of the, the <laughs> wide ocean. Um, <laughs> But just stuff like that, you know, like there's such a, a, a varied uh, film industry here. And that was kind of a question I was hoping to add on there before I have a look at the, I think a couple of questions have come in there on the chat. But what do you see as the future of Irish cinema? Like, for example, like animation is obviously huge. We've had, you know, Oscar, Cartoon Saloon in particular, like Oscar nominated films and just great stuff coming out in the animation front. We obviously have like I mean I, I was never like as into kind of Irish cinema as I have for the last few years but to my eyes as sort of a lay person it seems that the horror genre is really taking off in Ireland and just different things like that so what do you see as the next big thing in Irish cinema? As well it should by the way I mean uh, Irish folklore uh, has tales that can curdle your blood there is a vast vast fertile ground of, of horror waiting for anybody that really wants to till that ground I mean uh, banshees, uh, you know, even the, uh, those fairies and those uh, those trees there that, that they, they, I forget what they're called now. Look, I still have a nightmares about the banshee and Darby Gill and Little People. <laughs> I, that movie is like a million years old and I have never recovered from that banshee. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know, just the idea that there's certain types of trees and all of you mess with them that you could just wind up with like some kind of poltergeist messing with you yeah. for the next 10, 15 years, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I said I saw an example of a highway that was built around one, for example. Yeah, no, it's true. Like nobody will admit to believing in the fairy people, but like I'm from down the country, you do not step foot in the fairy fort. You don't knock over that tree. You don't walk there. Don't go into that field. You know, you give. You may not believe it or talk about it, but you do give them their space. So there's there's a huge opportunity there for for those stories to be told too. Absolutely, uh, those stories. A uh, cartoon saloon is a great example. Now there's an example where. Uh, they have made uh, three films right off the top of my head, uh, The Wolf Walkers, The C uh, uh, Secret of Kells, and Song of the Sea, mm -hmm. where they did play into uh, what, I, what us diaspora Irish Americans, Irish Canadians might look to uh, fancifully, right? That kind of leprechaun lens. Mm -hmm. But what they've done is they've dug into actual, um, like scholarly, what I would call more scholarly folklore, right? Yeah. Which is wonderful. Like just mm -hmm. amazing folklore that, that's rooted in actually write, uh, the annals and other writings that go back thousands of years. And, uh, and it's so good. And it's so much better than what was been, has been put out for the last 120 years. So I think the future is now that they're getting more of a voice, it takes a bit of time for the market to correct itself, as they say. Mm -hmm. It was starting to turn around. The Irish Film Board was, was set up in 1980. It wound up going under in 1987. And then some great films like My Left Foot was made from external funding and they realized, oh, this is not good. I mean, we need, there's value here and we can't have basically American or British people holding us up. So they got back into it in 1993. So you're talking really, you know, 20, 28 years and it's starting to show. So you're seeing that. So, so the Irish are able to say, listen, okay, you like the leprechaun stories, you like that. Well, let's show you how it's really done. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're getting with Cartoon Saloon. So you can have that fantasy, that fairy tale, but you're getting the, the triple A grade stuff. And I'm thinking that's really what the future is. You'll, you're going to get the, uh, the, 
the stuff that deals with the past traumas of Northern Ireland, uh, of politics of the Catholic Church, uh, state repression, a lot of th themes that uh, that were dealt with in the last few film festivals. That's going to be there, and that's going to be tough, but it's it's I think it's important. Mm -hmm. um, it helps work through uh, national trauma. Uh, LGBT cinema is growing, uh, thankfully, and it's getting better and better. Um, and I think of like Handsome Devil, which uh, we showed. It was an amazing film. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's what's going to happen. And then for the for the stuff that John Ford was into in Irish Americans, there's that that's there too. Uh, it's um, but it's going to be like in the form of these great horror films. They're going to get better. Uh, Cartoon Saloon. Mm -hmm. um, I even think of although it was an American production, um, uh, the Secret of uh, uh, Ron, uh, Ronan Ish. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think that was as well. Like short films are like we've a fantastic range of those. Actually, on the LGBT thing, I don't know have you seen it or looked at it yet for the film festival, but Dating Amber is definitely up there amongst the best LGBT films that I've seen in recent years. And um, it's fantastic. It's the same. It's the same lead actor from Handsome Devil, whose name escapes me right now. Um, yeah, it's it's really really good. And then my last question, I know I sorry I said my last one was my last one before YouTube, but one that just popped into my head there. Um, you know, there's been great collaboration between Ireland and Canada over the last few years for films. I think I can't remember which Oscar season it was, but you had like The Breadwinner, The Favorite, and before that there was Brooklyn Room. These are all Irish Canadian co-productions, and you know, like it's fantastic to see the collaboration between the two countries. And I'm wondering, like you know, your film festival and other Irish film festivals in the country are really, you know, hyping that up as well. So what, have you any thoughts on what could be next there? I think that'll continue to grow. I think uh, co-productions are the future, especially with financing being more and more difficult. Films are getting more expensive. So you need, yeah. to, and I guess it's ever been, it's ever been so, right? Because we just talked about uh, Major General uh, Dalton and his issues with financing including trying to make an Irish studio seem like a UK studio while also being an Irish studio. Yeah. <laughs> so the co-productions though, and in a way he was doing, he was actually engaging in probably a very primitive version of co-productions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they're important because they can get the financing, but also you don't lose control of the stories as much either. And it could be more of a, a quid pro quo as well. So uh, where a co-production like I think of Maudie, which was an Irish Canada production, but it's very much a North American story. Yeah. Uh, but Brooklyn is is very much an Irish story mm -hmm. uh, of immigration, you know, which uh, and and missing home. Even though it's half and half in uh, well, based in Brooklyn, like the toast title, but it was actually filmed in Montreal in Ireland. Yeah. And um, but still, that story is very Irish. You're mm -hmm. right. Even though it's uh, a lot of it was actually located here. So I find that it's it's good. So it. I think that's the other thing about co-production is we can have a more open communication and a more real representation also of the relationship between Ireland and its massive diaspora, which mm -hmm. is 50 or 60 million that can yeah. be tied back or something like that. Mm -hmm. Something that wasn't happening a hundred years ago uh, where American productions would just come in and they would use their talent and uh, they might use a couple of local actors there and they would just tell the story that they wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And then they would leave, and yeah. then they would sell their. They would sell to American audiences. Mm -hmm. And then uh, years later, when uh, travel became easier, scores of us tourists came over with uh, with the wrong idea of what our experience was going to be. <laughs> and you found out we had cars, and you were so disappointed. <laughs> there was electricity. How would yeah, this? What is happening? Yeah, I was shocked <laughs> in two thousand when I came. I saw electricity everywhere. Come on. <laughs> well, if there's no electricity, you wouldn't be able to watch the film. So <laughs> there's the pros and cons of everything. Um, I'm just having a look here on the on the YouTube to see what's coming in. So a couple of comments. Remember May Finchie's Circle of Friends film adapted from her book of the same name. I'm not too sure she was happy with the ending Hollywood produced. Uh, someone picking up on my accent thing. Uh, Julia Roberts as Kitty Kiernan and Michael Collins had no accent at all. And um, uh, oh, and a, a point here uh one of our irish film festival auto committee members is moving to cartoon saloon in august so shout out to neve right congratulations neve that's yeah, exciting we, that's got awesome. we got somebody on the inside <laughs> and michael Collins and everything, everything. <laughs> an interesting one because that is uh i know liam neeson considered his most important role next to uh um schindler oscar schindler yeah. 
I can't speak, I can't remember if he said one's more important than the other, but I think those two stand out for him anyways. Mm -hmm. That's probably why he does the films he does today, because he's good. But yeah. uh, but at the same time, that's very much an example of where money kind of got in the Hollywood side, got a bit in the way. Um, I kind of say you have to be pragmatic. I mean, you need someone like Julie Roberts to help sell the film. For sure. And it was painful to listen to her talk, um, <laughs> that accent, and I didn't think she was a good casting for it anyways. But also politically, there's an example of Major Emmett Dalton. You would think he would have been a major part of that story, and mm -hmm. he's completely washed, whitewashed out of it. Um, for if you, I don't know, folks have probably been a while since they've seen it, but his advisor in the film is a Joel Riley, I think his name is. He's got a mustache. Uh, he's a shorter guy. Um, that's basically the Dalton care. That's basically Dalton, but he's been uh, turned into like two or three people put into one. Mm -hmm. But at least they got the mustache right because Dalton had a mustache too, if I remember, <laughs> you know, so. But they, unfortunately, uh, for whatever reason, they left Dalton out of it. Um, but uh, I don't know a whole lot about Irish politics, but I have a, I, get, I see Fianna Fáil show up a lot and, and, and as an adversary to Dalton. So I have a feeling um, it'll take a little while for his story to be completely told, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I haven't actually seen Michael Collins in years, but I do remember the accents <laughs> still to this day. Um, yeah, I think um, I think that that's there's no other questions coming in there. I think then from from me, I think it was interesting uh, just in terms of the types of stories that we're telling now in Ireland was uh, when you guys screened uh, uh, Black Forty Seven as the opening film, and I came along to that, and you know we were talking beforehand and. It's just, you know, it's, what was it, 2019 was that one that was? And it was the first time anyone's ever made a movie about the famine. You know, like when, like yeah. just the fact that we're stepping into the spaces of stories that we never have before as well, I think is really interesting now. Exactly, like for that, uh, that uh, documentary series I mentioned earlier, they did a mm -hmm. series on the famine, it was like back in 93. Yeah. And, uh, and since then, as we did a few things on the famine this year as well, a few films on the famine. And it was recognized that this is just something people didn't talk about. Yeah. And uh, what's interesting as well is they didn't just take the famine story. They turned it into a, like a Western. Yeah. And they, I don't want to be disrespectful, but in a way that they had fun with it too. Like mm -hmm. uh, they made it into a, a bit of an adventure and because film is to entertain as well. I mean, yeah. it's to enlighten, but it's to entertain. Mm -hmm. And even uh, a rocked uh, that we showed this year, which oh, I thought yeah. was a great film. Mm -hmm. I mean, as the director himself says, it's not really a film about the famine, it's just set in the famine. Yeah. I think that's when you're really mad, mad me hitting that area where the Irish are really telling their own stories, where I might look at it as 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 a Canadian, like, oh, it's a famine film, but it's really actually it's a fa it's a story, it's a different kind of story. It's, yes. it's a story that happens to be within the famine, mm -hmm. you know, which I think is better, you know. And it, so you learn about the famine a little more, but it, you get more out of it too. You get a social history. Because politics at any time and anywhere, but especially in Ireland, is always complicated, yeah. and that's a better that's a better way of of, of uh, getting into into that. Because because cinema can also inform as well as entertain. For sure, yeah. and brilliant. So there's there's no other questions coming in there, but uh, I just want to say from my side, just thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us tonight. This has been really really interesting. I could listen to you talk about all of these topics for hours but I will uh, let you return to your evening but uh, this is brilliant and um, do you want to tell people what you're kind of working on more long term on this kind of thing? Yes uh, I like to thank the uh, the Irish Embassy for, for having me on to to ramble on about this. Um, I've been working on this I've been developing a podcast series that I hope to have out in the next few months uh, that it'll be uh, Irish uh, Irish film history podcast and uh, I promise to go into much more detail. And, uh, and I also promise they won't be very long episodes, 30, 40 minutes max. But uh, there's so much, there's so much to talk about. I barely skimmed over. And uh, I'm looking forward to really getting into the nitty gritty and the details and the personal stories about the different characters uh, involved in the history of Irish film. There's a lot to, many, 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 many episodes to come on that. Also, if I could take a moment to, uh, to thank uh, the co-founders and the many committee members uh, that have helped with the Irish Film Festival that's brought me here sitting with you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they've done an amazing gr a job over the last seven years. Um, they're a cross-section of the Irish community and they're all dedicated to Irish film and telling Irish stories and they're wonderful people and I'm really grateful to them. 
yeah and I can second that like it's a great committee of people and the the film festival is something that we as the embassy are really proud to fund through the Emirates support program as well and um, so it's been great kind of collaborating with you guys uh, over the last few years since you um, became one of the grantees of ESP yes. so that's been brilliant but um, yeah so thank you so much Patrick and thank you to everyone for tuning in tonight and uh, this video will be available on YouTube um, for however long so if you just tune in a bit late or anything we'll leave it up so you can watch